Hello students, this is Professor McCoy. It's Wednesday, April 22nd. Uh, we're back here with Ben Crump's Open Season, The Legalized Genocide of Colored People. We're going to do chapters 7, 8, and 9. Uh, yes, our time is coming close to an end. Chapter 7, Voter Suppression, A New Form of Segregation Caught Up in the System. So... I have prepared a PowerPoint that I will provide to you, and I've got a, um, some videos that I'll get to you as well. So the quote at the beginning of this chapter is uh, for voter suppression. Nobody in the world, nobody in history has ever gotten their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of the people who were opposing them. And that's by Asada Shakur. So... In this chapter, he talks about the Madison Nine. These are women that were arrested for allegedly delivering absentee ballots to some black voters rather than having the ballots sent by mail. And so he talks about that. It starts, it's, uh, he gets into that on, uh, it was on uh, 123, 124. So on um, 124, he says, uh, those who were arrested were nurses and teachers who had never been in trouble with the law. These women were pillars in their community. They became known as the Madison Nine. Their alleged offense, they delivered absentee ballots to some black voters rather than have than having the ballot sent by mail. At most, that was a technical violation of the law. And then it, he talks about on 125, voter fraud is a serious felony that upon conviction would keep these nine well-intentioned, law-abiding professional women from being able to vote or maybe even hold a job. As I was reading over this chapter, it made me think of a, a scenario that one of my friends had, um, Anuja Rajandra. She ran for, for state senate and uh, she experienced some uh, discrimination and uh, she was prosecuted uh, and, uh, you know, the folks rallied behind her. I know we packed the courtroom. Uh, she got some attorneys from the ACLU to, to help challenge the case. She ultimately prevailed. Uh, she's Indian, wonderful person, wonderful spirit. And, uh, but she got the black treatment. She got the black person treatment. And this was in Washtenaw County. So it's like, you know, folks think Washtenaw County is progressive and liberal. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that there's some conservatism going on in Washtenaw County too. You know, don't let the smooth taste fool you. Uh, so, so yeah, it's just, as I was reading this chapter, it's just sad because you have these black women, they're out there, they're doing their civic duty. They deliver these ballots to people and then they've got the conservative Republican establishment coming at them, coming after them in Florida. They said the case went on for two years and, you know, it's just... It, it was just sad to hear about that. Um, so they, he said that in this case, uh, let's see, they had, they had appointed a special prosecutor and he said he charged the nine middle-aged African-American nurses and school teachers with multiple counts of voter fraud because they helped get absentee ballots to people who wanted to vote and helped return these ballots to the supervisor of elections says here on 126, Carl Rove and other Republican strategists had concluded that they must limit early voting and absentee voting because too many poor black people who lacked transportation or couldn't get off from their work were now using this method to make their votes count. And they were changing the political landscape of America. The Republican white supremacist brain trust wanted to maintain control. So he said that, you know, they were seeing it at first, Republicans were really pushing the absentee ballot situation and then they were saying the black folks were using it and they were like, oh no, we gotta we gotta switch up our strategy on this. And so he talks about on 127, the absentee ballot and early voting are no longer the Republican friends. So they invented a new phrase, voter fraud. And to disenfranchise African Americans or at least to maintain their power. And what was the predictable first step to stamping out voter fraud to arrest black folks who helped other African Americans vote early or absentee if there was even the slightest departure from the elaborate and cumbersome rules for getting their ballots out and getting them back? 
he continues on uh, 128 to talk about the Florida statute. The Madison nine defendants were charged with violations of Florida statute section 104.041, which criminalizes conduct that perpetuates any fraud in connection with any vote cast to be cast or attempted to be cast. This statute makes such acts a third degree felony. The Florida courts, however, have stated it must be remembered, however, that is not a is not every infraction of the election code which calls for the imposition of the penalties prescribed thereby. The infractions in order to be subject to the sanctions of the statute must have been knowingly committed. And uh, and he also further on goes on to say on 128, what is significant about the Madison nine is that no vote was altered or cast by an unqualified voter. And in fact, the will of the voter was facilitated. Uh, the Florida Supreme Court has said if the vote is cast for the person for whom the qualified voter intended, defects in distributing and collecting the ballots are excused and the election laws are to secure, secure to the elector an opportunity to freely and fairly cast his ballot and to uphold the will of the electorate and prevent disenfranchisement. So he said many black people don't have permanent mailing addresses or they, they move often or stay with family. Voting is good citizenship. And anything that makes it easier for this segment of the population to vote is, is good for democracy. The essence of voter fraud is coercing people to vote for someone they don't want to, altering ballots or submitting ballots from people who didn't vote. If technicalities in, their, in the way ballots were sent out or returned constituted voter fraud, Al Gore well might have been declared the president over George uh, Bush. So basically he's talking about in this situation, I'm going to just break it down for y'all. The women did not do anything illegal. They have to show that they intended to do something legal. Like they basically deliver these absentee ballots to these people, these poor older people who couldn't, who couldn't go out and get them for themselves. They, they let them, the people voted freely. They didn't do anything to tamper with their vote. So they didn't do anything wrong, but the Republican conservative establishment in Florida decided to come after them anyway to, you know, again, teach these black people a lesson, just like they happened with my friend Anusia. She ran for office. She's Indian and they wanted it. And, you know, and people were kind of trying to say, oh, why is she running for office? You know, she needs to wait her time. And so once again, and that, unfortunately, in her situation, that was the Democratic Party that did that in Washington County. That was some folks from the dis. So that again, I'm here to tell you. White supremacy is everywhere. It's not just in the Republican Party. It's in the Democratic Party. So I know that's why they have had a lot of discussion about black folks, how we need to have our own party to really represent our interests. So uh, so it says in his deposition, Special Agent Riley of the FDLE conceded that no ballots were cast by people not qualified to vote. No ballot. No ballots were altered to interfere with the intended will of the voter. No ballots were cast for or by dead persons, every ballot was approved and accepted by the canvassing board as sufficient with a signature inspected and found genuine and nothing was done that interfered with the will of the voter. In fact, the actions of these women may have facilitated the vote being cast. So basically they're helping people who would typically be disfranchised to actually exercise their right, their constitutional right to vote. So It says, when pressed to explain how this conduct, conduct constituted criminal fraud, Agent Riley offered the following. Persons who might not otherwise have voted, voted. You know, in other words, some people who were not going to vote in the way that the Republicans wanted them to vote we're going to vote Democratic and, you know, they're not having that. So they got to set an example for these black people basically trying to say to black folk, oh, how dare you black people try to exercise or try to help other people exercise their right to vote. We're going to send a message to you. So... Montellus Roberson, one of the women charged with voter fraud, promised that she would never participate in the political process again if I would please just get her out of these criminal charges. I told her and the whole audience, don't stop helping others to vote and don't stop voting. This is, that's it. That is what racists want you to do. That is why Governor Scott's supporters brought these charges to intimidate and suppress your vote. Okay, again, I've talked about this in the class before. You know, I talked about how I was in South Africa. I studied about apartheid, went over there. I saw how it was in 1999, post-apartheid, how there were still remnants of apartheid there. And here in America, we have an American apartheid system. You know, you see it, it's, it's definitely bearing out with this coronavirus and things like the fact that we're dis black people are disproportionately being affected by it because of the issues of, of disparity in terms of 
our healthcare system, education, employment, the whole shebang. Now you got people that are rushing to hurry up and open the country up again. And it's like, they don't care. They don't care about how, if they open it up, it could hurt their, their parents or grandparents hurt them. You know, they're, if, or hurt people of color, poor people. They don't care. They just want to open it up. You know, it's like spring fever or something. Folks trying to open it up. And then the other issue is this too. You got people who are encouraging them to open it up business folk that aren't going out there protesting and subjecting themselves, um, subjecting themselves to the risk of getting harm from protesting. So it's like, I've talked about this before. You've got um, the elite establishment getting poor folk to do the bidding. And you know, poor folk, white folk, black folk, y'all need to wake up. Don't be doing other people's bidding. You got to do for you. Uh, so, I told her and the whole audience, so he said, basically, don't let them pressure you. It says, these charges were brought to convince you to stay at home and stay out of the, the political process. If you quit, they win. If you quit, they win. So it's the same thing, you know, you guys are students with education. Some of you are going to be graduating. So you're going to graduate and it's a whole new world. You're going to have to learn how to get on technology. You know, there's jobs out there, but you're going to have to be creative. You may have to create your own opportunities, create your own jobs. And then for those that you are in school, you're just going to have to adjust, learn how to adjust. Uh, you know, I know I got an email about asking about uh uh, from the law school asking about us, some of us alum, if we would if provide some remote um, internships for students that, because their in-person internships were canceled, but they still want to have opportunities. And so I said, okay, I'll try to work, uh, either see if I have some opportunities in my office, or I'll try to connect with other lawyers, because Michigan's got 35,000 lawyers. So I'm sure there's some opportunities there for law students, college students, you guys, you just got to be I mean, you may not be, maybe you don't want to be a lawyer. Maybe you want to be a psychologist or a police officer. You just got to be creative and think, in a, think outside of the box. Uh, I know uh, Lieutenant Governor Garland Grillcrest was, I uh, went to this uh, virtual meeting a couple weeks ago and he was talking about how in this time, a lot of innovation is going to come up. So I, it's like, we all have creativity. This is a time for innovation. So, so he, uh, he says, um, 130 is he's recounting, recounting the experience of the Madison nine. As we arrived for the first hearing, I met reporters outside the courtroom and began my campaign to force the spotlight of public attention on this cruel effort at voter suppression. I met the assigned prosecutor and urged her to drop this baseless charge of voter fraud. This case, uh, would not be done in the quiet. And I wanted black voters, intelligent white voters everywhere to know what Megs and Scott were up to. And, uh, so they, uh, you know, he talks on 131, it gives us some background about the trial judge. He said he was an experienced former public defender, and we felt we'd gotten our first break in the case when he announced he would require the state to provide a definitive statement explaining how this was fraud. We prepared a motion to dismiss the charge, and then he goes on to discuss in this chapter how they had offered them some kind of diversion and you know, that, you know, the lawyers talked to them and they were evaluating it, but the women were like, why would we do, why would we plead to something that we didn't do? And, um, uh, it says on 132, these strong principled women said they would rather go to jail than admit what they did was wrong. They had lived their lives doing the right thing and they were not going to back down. They would not say they had done wrong when they had not. You know, I would say this again, I'm a criminal defense attorney 18 years. I it's, it's, it's unfortunate the way the system is stacked. A lot of times they'll charge you, you know, here in Michigan, we've got some strict, some severe strict prosecutors sometimes that will overcharge people. And people don't want to go to trial because they're scared. They're scared of going to jail or prison. But I would say, I say to them, look, if you're innocent, if you didn't do it, let's go to trial. Let's rock and roll. If you want to fight this, we'll fight. You know. Uh, so it says here, the freedom, the very freedom of the Madison Nine was at stake, and they had lost so much already. We carefully checked and then double checked the documents, and we wrote an extensive memorandum. So this is what the court had asked them to write. And then it was, it, it, he says on 133, after more than two years of stress anxiety, the court had dismissed all charges against her. So this is a, one of the folks uh, with the Madison Nine. And it says here, the state conceded at oral argument in this matter, that in this matter, that there is no evidence of conduct by defendant of intention to cast a false or fraudulent ballot, or that persons who were not authorized and entitled to vote, in fact, voted. It says, while preparing for this case, the prosecution did win one victory. The newly elected African-American supervisor of elections was removed from her post by Governor Scott 
by edict. She appealed and challenged the ruling and eventually she won. Uh, but she was out of the office for more than three years as the case wound through the system. The court required the state of Florida to repay all her attorney's fees, but the damage was done. She was out of office. Her reputation was ruined and she had lost the reelection bid. I mean, this is, again, it's, it's messed up. It's American apartheid. That's the system. Uh, so it says uh, he, you know, he talks on uh, 135. He said, Reverend Lee, then a, a chapter of the, then started a chapter of the National Association of Advanced Color People. He used his printing press and leaflets. So he's talking about a case a scenario from somebody from 1955. Um, how he was galvanized people, getting black folk together, getting people together to um, vote. And then how it says, when the word of the meetings and the crowds and attendance spread, whites in towns organized to fight back. They gathered a list of all the black people who had registered to vote and sent the list to white businessmen who, if they were their employers, fired them from their jobs. And if they were landlords, raised the rent. But that didn't stop blacks as even more continued to register to vote. When word spread that Reverend Lee was amassing a sizable group of registered black voters, he received death threats. White officials in Humphreys County offered Lee protection under the condition that he end his voter registration rallies. He refused. And it says that uh, basically it talks about he was hit by gunfire and uh, you know, it's some of the same, I've, we've talked about this, some of the same stuff over and over again. He, you know, he was struck, he was fatally injured. It says in the 2000, the FBI files were finally released that gave the details of the murder case against two suspects, Peck Ray and Joe David Watson Sr. It revealed that both had been members of the White Citizens Council and both had died in the 1970s. A local prosecutor refused to take the case to a grand jury. Again, all this stuff, We've got prosecutors' races going on. We've got them in Washington. We've got them in Wayne. Now we have them in Macomb. That's why it's important uh, for if you live in any of these counties or if you have an inclination to help out, you know, again, the pandemic, reach out to the campaigns, volunteer. If, if we don't get progressive people in these offices, we're not going to, the system will just stay the same. It'll be the same as it is. Um, 136, there are just, um, you know, he's just talking about these cases. These are the casualties. Uh, he had talked about a, another case from 1961 uh, where a person, uh, it was, a, it says a witness, it was a scenario where a person was killed again, connected to exercising right to vote. And he said, these are two of the many casualties of the black suffrage movement whose stories are not often told. The United States has a long, shameful history of disenfranchising what has been at times a majority of its population by preventing non-land owning white men from voting. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 granted citizenship to all native born Americans, but it did not give these newly recognized citizens the right to vote. After passage of the 15th amendment to the constitution in 1869, African-American men gained the right to vote. In practice, however, as these two stories illustrate attempting to write it, attempting to exercise this right nearly 100 years after the 15th Amendment was enacted could still prove deadly. In addition to the threats of violence and often actual violence, Black Americans were further impeded from voting when states like Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Alabama, and Virginia passed grandfather clauses in the 1890s. And so a grandfather clause it's a law that means that you can only vote if your grandfather could vote prior to 1867. And for black folk, prior to 1867, we were slaves. So it wasn't going to be viable. Uh, he also talks in this book, um, in chapter seven, about Shelby versus Holder. And that's in your PowerPoint. Justice is held that the Voting uh, Rights Act was passed to address racial discrimination that in their view is no longer much of a problem because this decision allows states to redraw the lines of voting precincts and implement the kind of requirements that have in the past prevented African-Americans uh, from voting. So it's just, it's, and that's on 138, let's see. He talks on 139 about voter suppression of blacks on voting uh, rosters leads to diminished presence on jury pool. I know uh, my mentor, Judge Thomas, uh, she 
had asked the clerk to uh, show the voting rolls and, and show efforts in, in terms of Wayne County of uh, efforts to make sure that there's diversity on the jury pool, because a lot of times that's that's not the case. You don't have a diverse jury pool. And, and you know, we've talked about this with some of the other cases. It's like you you have a right to a jury of your peers, but, it, but that's not always the case. Uh, he talked on 139 to 140 about voter intimidation of college students. And so I would just say, you wanna be mindful of all these things. You know, why are these things that happened in the past, the, the far past and the more recent past important? Because we have an election coming up. Uh, you know, we have a primary in August, and we have election coming up in November. We've already seen with Wisconsin, how there was some I efforts at voter suppression. Uh, you know, they you had the COVID going on and you had that uh, conservative judge that was running and the governor had said that they should shut things down. And then the people, uh, we're saying, you know, you know, the the conservative legislature decided to keep things open and then but the people spoke and they put in a progressive judge. And so that's why we've got some races coming up with state rep state senators. You gotta be mindful of that. Make sure that there's progressive people. And if if you don't see people that you think are doing the right by the system, then you may need to run for your run yourself, you know. Um chapter eight. So in chapter eight, it's a new form of segregation. So he talks about on 146, the disparity between public schools and charter schools. Um, he also talked about uh, Michigan's own Attorney General Dana Nessel, her fight uh, to ensure that uh, she said there is a right to a minimally adequate education on page 147. Uh, she talks, he talks on um, 148 about the effects of white flight, how white residents fleeing from cities to suburbs to escape the proliferation of black residents has exacerbated the funding shortage, leaving cities struggling to fund schools in the face of dwindling tax bases. And then he talks on 151 about the opportunity gap, the inability for African-American children to access quality preschool programs. Uh, he references on 151 as well, the Perry preschool study, those who received a quality education, completed more education, including graduating from high school, had much lower teen pregnancies and out of wedlock births and were much, much less likely to be arrested for violent crimes or serve time in prison. Black preschool children are suspended at a higher rate than white preschool children. So he talked about that. He talked about the disparity in terms of how teachers would look at, at, at children. Um, and he also talked on 155 about how the early suspensions feed the school to prison pipeline. Uh, I think I'll say this, you know, because I, I, it, it's since March I've been working as an educational advocate. It's been uh, three years now, and that's part of why I uh, decided to shift from my a lot of my work in a courtroom and going into the classroom and being an advocate and. Uh, you know, there are advocates that are non-lawyers, there are advocates that are lawyers, but we definitely need more uh, folks to come into that field of advocacy, of making sure that the, the, the parents and the students get the right supports. I mean, right now with the pandemic, you have a lot of this stuff is going online, uh, but you know, there's this issue of, uh, and I know we're, we get into that, he gets into that too, there's this issue of not everybody having access to internet. Not everybody has access to laptops. And it's like, we're in America. We're in one of the most wealthiest countries in the world. And it's shameful. Nobody should be limited from having uh, the ability to have access to education. It, it's, you know, I go back to that movie Race, uh, that Jesse Owens story. Just imagine if we had a system that was not, uh, if we didn't have this apartheid system that has to deal, has these issues as far as racism, classism, and sexism, we would be so much further as a people, as, as a nation, if, if we weren't confined by xenophobia uh, and in the, the isms. So he uh, references on 156, uh, APA Journal of Personality and Social Psychology researchers found that those who dehumanize blacks were more likely to have used force against a black child in custody than officers who did not dehumanize blacks. So that's where they talked about, they did a study of some of the police officers and that's what they found. They, again, this goes back to implicit bias, these studies, I mean, we've got to root out, you know, to my people out there, to the police officers, 
you know, y'all got to root out, you know, I know y'all got the blue brotherhood thing going on, but hey, it's, it's, it's about the human thing. That's first and foremost, you got to make sure that you're not mistreating people. Uh, you know, I understand you guys have to uphold the law and order, but there's also, there's right and wrong. And as far I'm a spiritual person, God sees everything. So, and if, if you have police officers going out there mistreating folk, then they're putting everybody, other, other good police officers' lives at risk because if, if folks get out there and they get mad, they get mad because of some other experience that they've had with the police officer, they might take it out on some of y'all that are the righteous officers. Uh, it says psychologist Robert J. Steinberg, he talks about the correlation between intelligence and culture. And this is on 157, that newly arrived African immigrants outperform more, most races in America's education system. He also further talks about the issue that we I just talked about a little bit earlier about technology. Making the internet affordable, accessible, and available is one way to raise up the disadvantage and disenfranchise and to level the educational and technological playing field. And he talks about digital redlining, you know, how there's a, a sister that's championing that cause. So that's chapter eight. Chapter nine, caught up in the system. Uh, he talks about uh, the experience of his cousin, uh, Marcus, dealing with allegations of sexual assault. Uh, you know, what he has, to, you know, just having to deal, you can't even be a young person these days. Uh, you know, what I've seen as I've worked in the courts representing children, I mean, you know, like, cause my, back in my, when I was younger, uh, if you got, people got into fights and stuff like that, the, the teachers, the teachers were the boss. They handle it. Yeah, they didn't just rush and suspend people and criminally charge people. You got, it's overkill with charging young folks. You got it happen. I see it in Washington County, Wayne County. It's, it's literally a school to prison pipeline. It's a prison industrial complex. It's, it's overkill. It's like, we've got, you know, there should be structures. It's really, I feel it should start in the home. Uh, and I mean, if, if there's some kids that don't have that in the home, that should be in the community, but it, it, it shouldn't just be, you know, locking kids up uh, for getting into, you know, fights, little fights, things like that. It's just, it's, it's too much. Um, he also talks in, um, in this chapter about direct file. It's the process allowing the prosecutors on their own largely, un, largely unrestricted authority to charge children as adults and move their cases from the presumably more compassionate juvenile court system to the more regimented adult court system without any involvement of a judge. Uh, so he talks about that on 176, 179, 181. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 this is just messed up. I mean, I think right now, uh, they just, I heard a report that there was, you know, I, I've talked before about Just Mercy, about what Brian Stevenson did as far as helping with the juvenile lifers, taking that case to the Supreme Court and uh, having these cases reevaluated. There, there were people who were prosecuted as, they were minors, but they were charged as an adult and they were sentenced to life in prison. So the Supreme Court said, well, those cases have to be evaluated because, you know, there's st studies out there showing the adult brain doesn't fully mature to the age of 25. And, but you have here, you've had prosecutors here in Michigan, you know, uh, that have been really staunchly opposed to resentencing people, to giving people, releasing people who have changed, you know, maybe people have been locked up 20, 30 years and they've changed their ways. And, but we, we don't really have that spirit of redemption um uh, forgiveness going on here and uh in it and it's unacceptable and i mean there's just this report about one of the people that one of the lifers was just about to be released but he ended up dying and in, in um it was in prison and i mean that's that's just it's it's a hot mess it's just it's unacceptable you know i understand you know i i respect law and order i mean again remember my mama i've talked about this before i have my mom as a nurse my dad's a lawyer I understand. I understand rules. My mama was the enforcer in our, our house. She was the real, the initial police. So she made sure she was also former military air force. So she had rules and regulations. I understand if you do wrong, there are going to be consequences. If I did wrong, I was going to get a whooping. I got a whooping. I get jacked up. I'm, I understand rules and consequences. There need, you can't just let people out there willy nilly, you know, doing any old thing. Uh, but there has to be uh, a balance and measure. There needs to be more programming, like restorative justice programs. There needs to be more preventative programs. You know, I you know I have the program I've talked about with what to do and stop by the police, and where we brought in police officers, prosecutors, uh, judges, 
and uh, to just talk to people about what to do when stopped by the police. And as I started doing the programs, I started seeing the young people coming out and they started, you know, at first you had folks that were kind of hostile or of the police. And then they started saying, hey, you know, they started seeing some of the black officers and they were like, oh, yeah, I want to become a police officer. How do I become a police officer? So it started changing minds, you know, changing mindsets. And, uh, you know, or they said, hey, maybe I want to be a judge or a defense attorney or prosecutor, things like that. And so uh, it takes the village, you know, they, that, that old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And, and we definitely need uh, we need to do that. And even some young adults, young, young people, young uh, people that make mistakes, they need to have the opportunity at redemption. And but our society right now has has been has has not been showing that mother love. It's been. It's been some harsh, harsh uh, responses to people. And uh, I'm not saying that if people, you know, if you commit a crime and you really jack somebody up, you should get a whooping. You should have, you know, look, I don't know, you have to be evaluate it on a case by case basis. I'm not saying people shouldn't be going to jail or prison if they really doing some crazy messed up stuff. Okay, yeah, no. But in other situations, you could be making them do community service. Like I like what uh, some of our uh, referees were doing at the juvenile court. They were with the kids. They were making them write a letter of apology, do some community service. May, write an essay about why what you did was wrong. You know, again, look at the situation. Some people, they have mental health issues. They've got uh, drug issues. We, we've got to be more holistic in our approach to how we help people. I mean, and across the nation, uh, you know, in some of the other states, you've had some prosecutors that are more progressive that have used programming that, that has been successful. You've got Kim Fox in Chicago. You've got Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore. Um, you know, you, you've got some progressive folks. So it's like, we, we need change, change equity in the system demands change. So, um, that's it for today. Uh, we got three more chapters to go. So I, I anticipate I'll be getting those videos out to you and then, uh, I'll be putting together the multiple choice final exam and I have the essays. I was just waiting for a couple more to come in and then I'll be grading those. And again, let me know if you have any questions. If you need anything, I'm here. You can call me. I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm do Zoom, Skype. I've learned how to do Google Hangouts. So uh, you all be blessed, be safe. Uh, you know, this has been some heavy stuff. I know some of you have lost loved ones, friends, family. I've had some folks, at least nine, 10 people I've personally known that have passed away. And I've just, I've been praying about it, praying, meditating about it. And you just gotta make sure you try to stick to a regular schedule. Don't, if you're somebody like me, don't watch too much of the news because that, that can definitely scare you, scare, you know, can stir up your spirit in a bad way. If you're sensitive like me, other people, Professor Taylor, he watches it. He can, he done, you know, he's all in. He said it doesn't affect him, but me, it affects me because I'm like, no, we got to do some change. And uh, so everybody be blessed and stay tuned for the next video.